Over the past few weeks, we've talked to scientists who've shown us how stars release energy, how galaxies form, how life might exist on exoplanets, and how black holes work. But there is a question that's gone unanswered, and it's a biggie. Why are we here? It's a question someday, when my baby daughter learns to speak and explore the world on her own two feet, that she'll probably ask me. She'll expect an answer that's straightforward, but I won't be able to give her that. I don't know if anyone will. Because even though scientists across the world are systematically deciphering the universe, chipping away at all that we don't know, the question stands. Why are we here? Why is the Earth here? Why is the sun, the Milky Way, the universe, why is any of it here? Why do we exist? So I'll give my daughter what we do know. That 13.8 billion years ago, in a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, the universe expanded into being. That expansion slowed eventually and let loose all this matter, radiation, energy, essentially all we know today. Even the little kiss I give my daughter on her forehead tonight is the result of all of this. And then, after the inevitable questions, I'll tell my daughter to keep exploring. Today on Nova Now, Universe Revealed, the Big Bang, the beginning and our inevitable end. I'm Alok Patel. Studying the origin of our universe is no small task. For millennia, entire civilizations and religions have attempted to explain our cosmic origins. But in the scientific community, there's a generally accepted model used to explain how the universe began. It's a household name, the Big Bang. This model hypothesizes that the universe once had a period of rapid expansion, which set the conditions for the creation of all the matter we see today. But this expansion was not actually an explosion, as the name implies. So I talked to not one, but two experts to help me wrap my head around this thing called the Big Bang, when maybe it should be called something different. I mean, the universe is big, it's old, it's been around for a long, long time, and yet there's just so much more that really genuinely is a deep mystery. David Kaiser is a physicist and historian of science at MIT. I respect people's personal beliefs about their own origin stories, but I want to find out an answer that makes sense in the language of science, from which we can actually make predictions for things we haven't seen yet. Haranya Pires is based at University College London and Stockholm University and works as a cosmologist. That's somebody who studies the universe, its origins, how it's evolving and what's going to happen to it in the future. So let's rewind to the beginning of time itself. So we know that the universe is expanding and that it was hotter and denser in the past. And if we extrapolate all of that back into the time when it was basically a dot, that is time equals zero. By rewinding the expansion of the universe, we can imagine all the matter contracting back upon itself into one point. And the idea of all the matter of the universe condensed into a single dot is known as a singularity. You can't actually really extrapolate everything back into the dot. We don't have a theory of physics that holds in that regime. So maybe the universe didn't actually start as a single dot per se. So it can be thought of as a phase transition. You see them every day when you boil a kettle of water, right? What happens to the water? It causes bubbles to form in the water, bubbles containing gas, and eventually, you know, the steam rises. So, you know, you can see the phase transition where there's water and then there's a bubble. Just like that, you can form a bubble universe. 
and we could be inside one of those bubble universes. And in that scenario, the time equals zero is the moment the bubble popped into being. What we see as a singularity in the Big Bang theory is just the moment the bubble was born. So there's no actual singularity happening. The idea is an alternative to the notion that the universe began as a single point. When water boils, bubbles form as the water molecules spread apart from each other and transition from liquid to gas. Though they're expanding, they didn't begin as a single dot. Even the smallest bubble is bigger than a singularity. Since we can't rewind all the way back to when time equals zero, we can try to get as close as we can to the moment we now call the Big Bang. But just as there was water in the kettle before the heat boiled it into gas, there was something, there had to be something, some set of conditions that allowed the Big Bang to occur. This is where an idea called inflation comes in. Which is the idea that the universe expanded very fast in a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a second right at the start. And that takes us back not to time equals zero, but to about time equals 10 to the minus 32 seconds or so. So we can rewind very close to time equals zero. So inflation was a kind of precursor. And in fact, this very early blip of cosmic inflation helped to set the conditions that we now call the Big Bang. The universe might have inflated rapidly, but it didn't explode like a bomb or fireworks like I always imagined. The Big Bang describes a phase through which the universe has evolved, as opposed to the start of everything. It's a set of conditions that are very different than what we're used to today. So what do we mean by the Big Bang? What are those conditions? It really comes down to three related kind of criteria. One was that the matter filling the universe was in thermal equilibrium. That was really important. There weren't some regions of space that were much hotter than others or colder than others. If there were, there would have been some heat exchange until they'd reached that equilibrium balance. Moreover, it was at equilibrium at a very high temperature, much hotter than what we would expect even at the, in the centers of stars today. And the third, again, related part is that the stuff that filled the universe, the kinds of matter, the particles zigging and zagging around, had such high energies because of that high temperature that they ran around and behaved much more like radiation. You all got that? Steady, super hot temperatures and matter behaving like radiation. It's not exactly an environment that anyone would find familiar. If anyone had been there at the time, they'd probably have superpowers by now. That special set of conditions is what we now call the Big Bang. But now we've come to understand there were processes, almost certainly before that, that set up those conditions. The Big Bang was the outcome of some prior physics and stuff happening. So if there was something before the Big Bang, what did the universe look like then? Even before what we now refer to as the Big Bang, when the universe was filled, or dominated at least, with a very, very simple form of matter, Electrons are actually more complicated to describe mathematically than this other form of goop that seems very likely to have been filling the universe or dominating. When I say it was simple, I mean it had zero electric charge. It almost certainly had zero intrinsic angular momentum or spin. And that means it can actually store up potential energy even better than the more familiar forms of matter around us can do today. This goop wasn't goop as we know it. Think of it more like an energy field with tiny quantum fluctuations in it. According to quantum physics, empty space isn't empty at all, but instead it's filled with particles that pop in and out of existence. And when energy particles pop in and out of existence like this, they're known as quantum fluctuations. So a completely flat space, if you visualize it as a rubber sheet, perhaps acquires tiny little ripples in it. Rubber sheet is two-dimensional. This is really happening in three dimensions, but it's basically like a little ripple in the curvature of space. And that then gets stretched to the size of the universe. If you think about how matter is distributed in our universe, you'll notice there are areas like galaxies where huge amounts of matter are clumped together. At the same time, there are also huge voids between galaxies where matter is less abundant. If the universe had expanded from completely uniform, homogeneous goop, 
matter itself would be distributed evenly, everywhere, creating a consistent, unvarying universe. Since we can observe that the distribution of matter in our universe is uneven, the original source of all that material must have had some variations in it as well. According to the theory of inflation, these quantum ripples were those variations that were then amplified by the rapid expansion of the universe that happened in a tiny fraction of a second. The variations ultimately determined where large or small clumps of matter would end up in the universe. But inflation doesn't expand the universe forever. When we talk about early universe inflation or primordial inflation, that definitely ended. And in fact, in our current understanding, that's what set up the conditions for that Big Bang phase. After inflation ended, the structure that was imprinted on the universe by the quantum ripples eventually gave way to the formation of basic particles. Particles you all know and love. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. And these particles formed a kind of primordial soup. So actually, what most people mean by the Big Bang when you're an astronomer is the hot Big Bang. It is the very early primordial soup that cooked up all of the elements that we see in the universe today, but just hydrogen, helium, bit of lithium, very light elements. So that hot, dense soup can be called the hot Big Bang. In the primordial soup, these light elements weren't evenly dispersed which ultimately led to them being distributed unevenly across the universe. There were also clumps of dark matter there, which led ordinary matter to condense to form stars and galaxies. And as we learned in our episode about fusion, it's stars that go on to cook up the heavier elements in our universe. But there's still that tantalizing question of what happened in that teeny amount of time between inflation and the primordial soup. I must say, this era, which is between the end of inflation and about the first three minutes where all the elements get cooked, that era is a kind of here be dragons era. It's kind of dark in terms of our current understanding. Despite inflation having ended, our universe continues to expand, but it's doing so at a much slower rate than during inflation. And check this out we can actually measure the precise rate at which our universe is currently expanding. So to do that, you need to measure a distance and a velocity. So there's a thing called redshift, which is basically that when the universe is expanding, light gets stretched out. So the wavelength of light gets stretched out with the expansion of the universe. Waves of red light have longer wavelengths than waves of blue light. This effect is called redshift, because as wavelengths of light in the universe get stretched out, they get redder. If you installed a bright white light on the back of a spaceship and watch it fly away super fast at millions of miles an hour, the light would look red to your eyes. That effect of redshift allowed people to work out that things that were far away were getting further away, that there's a general velocity away from us. And because we are not at a unique location in the universe, it's not that everything's getting further away from us, everything's getting further away from everything else. You know, if I'm trying to make an analogy here, if I'm trying to think about this and I say, hey, we're in a ice skating rink and the ice skating rink is the universe, and I have skaters in the ice skating rink. Are the skaters moving around from one another or is the rink just expanding and it making it seem like the skaters are moving apart when in reality we aren't? And I guess maybe the skaters could be galaxies. That's a great way to think about it. So both are happening, but the dominant effect, when astronomers get their biggest telescopes, the dominant effect is the rink getting bigger. So of course galaxies move. There are what we would call local motions. That would be like the skater doing some fancy maneuver. So there's real motion. Galaxies move, they change. But the dominant effect, when we look at on the largest distances that we can measure with our most powerful telescopes, is that space itself is stretching between those skaters, between those galaxies. So by measuring the redshift of the light from faraway galaxies, we can determine that the universe is expanding in all directions at 
once. So that allowed us to start to use light like a time machine. So the further you look out into the universe, it's like a form of time travel. You see things as they were earlier in the history of the universe. Since light travels at exactly 186,000 miles per second, a light year is the distance light travels in one year. When we observe a galaxy that's 5 billion light years away from us, we're seeing light that's traveled across space for 5 billion years before reaching our telescope or eyeball. So by looking at this light, it's as if we've traveled back 5 billion years in time. So now, if we think about the oldest light in the universe, the first light ever emitted, you'd think it would be from the very beginning, 13.8 billion years ago. But we can't measure what light there was at the very beginning. It wasn't until a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang before light could actually travel freely. We think of light being able to travel so easily. I can see across the street. Our telescopes can look deep into the night sky. But in the earliest phases of our universe's history, the universe was opaque. Light simply couldn't travel. It was filled with a plasma of charged particles. That's like a thousand soccer players trying to play soccer on one crowded soccer field. All these charged particles are like those soccer players and the light is like a soccer ball. Every charged particle is either scattering or absorbing light. So light just can't travel very far before it gets kicked or scattered or absorbed. Our universe was like that for its earliest moments during and after this Big Bang phase. There was no free light to travel. The first time it begins to travel, conditions have changed just enough that those free electrically charged particles sort of team up into electrically neutral atoms. And that happened at a particular moment in our universe's history, about 380,000 years after this Big Bang set of conditions. So only after nearly 400,000 years was light able to travel any substantial distance. And that remnant glow from that first moment light could begin to travel, that fills the universe. And it's been cooling and stretching ever since for the next 13.8 billion years. That is the leftover heat of the Big Bang. So at the time that this light was released, it was very, very high energy light, like gamma rays. And over time, the wavelength of that light got stretched out so much that it is now observed in the microwave frequencies. The oldest and farthest away light in the universe is known as the cosmic microwave background. It was detected by accident. They had built a, a radio telescope at Bell Labs and it was built to do something far more mundane. Basically, they wanted to measure the radiation from gas between the stars or something like that. And when they turned it on, they found that there was a hiss or noise in the instrument. And it was coming from all over the sky. And they were very confused and they thought there was something wrong with their experiment. And they actually thought it was pigeon droppings. That's right. The researchers thought pigeon poop was causing distortions in their readings. So what did they do? They climbed into the telescope and they cleaned the droppings out. That didn't change it, and the noise continued to go on. And then they happened to communicate with their colleagues at Princeton University, which was looking for this afterglow of the Big Bang. They had been actively looking, and these guys found a hiss that actually was, you know, what, what was expected. So that's how it was discovered. And so that microwave light, if you can observe it, then you see a picture of the universe when it was about 380,000 years old. It's now about 13.8 billion years old. So it's the baby picture of the universe. It wasn't until 1992 that we learned that this hiss, that radio hiss that's coming from all over the sky, it seemed very, very uniform in its signal, had tiny variations in it because those tiny variations are the signals, the fingerprints of the origin of structure. Entirely new instruments were developed that were sensitive enough to measure such minuscule differences. NASA's COBE satellite, short for Cosmic Background Explorer, was the first to take readings of both the temperature of the cosmic microwave background and its tiny variations. 
since then, we have been mapping that better and better. To date, the highest resolution data we have on the cosmic microwave background comes from the European Space Agency's Planck satellite, which released its first set of data in 2013. This image, which is the closest one to date to the Big Bang. And you can see the seeds from which the universe is coming, galaxies, stars, planets, and humans. It could measure tiny, tiny variations of about a millionth in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. And it had high resolution. And by measuring in many frequencies, you can make a very pristine, clean map of just the background. And that map was both extremely high resolution compared to the previous satellite missions and also very sensitive to tiny variations at small scales. So it was a precision mission. It took the cosmological model and refined it. And is there a point where we won't be able to see the radiation anymore? Like, are we lucky? Like, hey, we we caught it in this moment in time? That's an extremely good question. So I think, you know, it just gets colder and colder and colder as time goes on, right? So that means you need more and more and more sensitive instruments to measure it. It's hard enough as it is. One of the reasons we measured it was it was still possible to see it by accident in a radio telescope. And that's why we knew there was something to look for, right? But if we don't know that there's something to look for, why would we go after it? So I I do think that you're right, that at some point, whatever intelligent creatures arise, in the future might not be able to measure it. By looking up at the night sky, we've been able to figure out how the entire cosmos came to be, back to a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. By uncovering our origins, maybe we can start to understand how and why we're even here at all. It's not a completely fleshed out theory. I think that it's fair to say that what we have currently is a toy model of working understanding of the very early universe. If the models of the early universe can make predictions about what we should see in the present, can we also use those models to predict where our universe is headed? After the break, the future. So what does this all tell us about the future of our universe? Is there a point in which all of a sudden we won't have the matter to contain the universe and it's going to collapse back on us? Like, what does this tell us about the next billion years? So actually, this is something we figured out by studying, among other things, the cosmic microwave background. Here again is cosmologist Hiranya Pires. And just in the last couple of decades, we figured out actually that it is going to expand forever at an accelerated rate As the distance between galaxies expands and stars gradually die out, the universe will become colder and darker. But physicist David Kaiser says this won't quite be the end. So then we get to more exotic possibilities in this very distant, dark, cold, lonely future. We know that there are gajillions of very massive black holes in the centers of most, if not all, large galaxies, for example. These are called supermassive black holes because they're millions or even billion times more massive than our own sun. So they're enormous, enormous, monstrous collections of mass. And so those can attract each other from gravity. They can merge, one can absorb the other. So we might have a phase where black holes kind of duke it out for a while, and those become the dominant kind of players in the story. But even black holes have a limited lifetime. So if you want to ask what's going to happen really, really, really forever from now, even those monstrous colliding black holes will have become a memory, will have become a thing of the past. So it looks like we're heading towards a big, fat, empty nothing. (laughs) It's not the most inspiring view. It's a very bleak, cold, horrible future, sadly. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, it's gonna take trillions of years, so don't worry. Let's worry about climate change instead. (laughs) I, listen, I'm with you on that. If the idea of a cold, dark, empty future seems full of despair, maybe there's still hope in the idea of a multiverse, a possibility mentioned in movies like Spider-Man Far From Home. I'm sorry, you're saying there's a multiverse? 
Because I thought that was just theoretical. I mean, that completely changes how we understand the initial singularity. We're talking about an eternal inflation system, and how does that even work with all the quantum? <laughs> it's insane. So is it possible that we are just in one universe and somewhere else that there's another bubble universe and we're, we haven't seen a connection between the universes yet? Absolutely. That, that's exactly what the theory I told about earlier actually implies, that there are bubble universes elsewhere. If there's one, there'll be others and there will outside our current observable horizon. I think of a bathtub with soap bubbles and here the bathtub itself is growing and you have more and more bubbles in between. So it will be extremely unlikely, as far as our best estimates would suggest, extremely unlikely for two bubbles ever to collide. So we would be causally disjoint, meaning we're no way to influence or be influenced by these other bubbles, most likely. And yet they could very well be popping up all the time. And in fact, there could be not just one or two, there might be an infinite number of them. I can't even wrap my head around that. I can't wrap my head around the fact of how big the Milky Way is, let alone the fact that there's 100 billion other galaxies, and now you're saying there might be another universe also. Yeah, but our conception of ourselves in relation to the size of the universe has changed dramatically in the last 100 years or so. In the early part of the 20th century, we didn't even know that there were other galaxies. Right? So first we thought the Earth was the center of the universe. Then we found out there was sun at the center of our solar system. Then we found we were living in a, a galaxy. And then we found out there were other galaxies. Now we think there are billions of galaxies in the observable universe. And, you know, to me, it doesn't sound that surprising that there are other universes. I want to caution that these ideas spring from well-motivated, well-tested theories, but they're beyond what we can sort of directly measure or test. They're at the, really at the kind of cutting edge of some of our theorizing. And I think it's not just that there would be separate bubbles in this scenario. The laws of physics themselves might be different in each bubble. So it's not just that there's many copies in which there might be many Milky Way galaxies that are kind of the same. I mean, there could be different nuclear forces. There could be different particles. They could have different properties. The laws of nature might actually, in that sense, be local, just a local accident as opposed to forced by the laws of nature. And I find that just amazing. I love this stuff. It's so rad. Total sci-fi. But is it actually worth spending our resources on studying these cosmic origin theories? First of all, it's worth it because this is, to my mind, an unparalleled human adventure. I mean, to be able to not just sort of daydream about what's the universe like, but to be able to, to try to pose increasingly well-posed questions, get increasingly precise measurements from the world well beyond our familiar. This is extraordinary. And then, of course, along the way, we learn a lot. We train a lot of really smart people who can do lots of things with those critical thinking skills. We think about the impact from, say, quantum theory on the world we live in. You know, quantum theory has been responsible, indirectly at least, for the consumer electronics revolution, for lasers, for all the things we rely on in getting around the world every day. And so how do you put a price tag on the fundamental curiosity for how atoms behave if you really try to bundle up what has come from our effort to learn in a very you know, curiosity-driven way about the structure of atoms or the structure of our cosmos? It has led to directly important ways that have improved and changed our lives. But we can't deny the fact that it's expensive, and we really have to be able to make that case in a proactive way. It's a search for our own origins, isn't it? And all the work that I do is working out smaller pieces of that very big question. And eventually, maybe, we will learn, maybe not during my lifetime, but, you know, we will learn why there is something rather than nothing. Haranya Pires and David Kaiser aren't alone in their philosophical musings. Everyone I've spoken with for this podcast has reflected on what inspires them in their pursuit to understand our universe. Looking up at the stars, I think, is a universal age-old phenomenon that leaves you full of wonder. And so I think curiosity does drive a lot of our exploration in this area. But it's also this sort of innate human sense for connection, right? Of belonging, of knowing, is there anyone else out there? There's this trade-off between exceptionality and loneliness. Until we find life out there, we're exceptional. 
but there's only us. And if we can make that trade, there's a whole universe out there of life. And I just can't wait to be mediocre on a universal scale. It's the young people. They inspire me because of their dedication to what? Not just how cool the science of fusion is. It's just like, can we bring this to bear on the most important problem of our generation? Just look at what we've done in you know the short time we've had the scientific method. You know, I can't imagine the next two, three hundred years. The last hundred were a doozy. So we are made of stardust, and this stardust has undergone billions of years of chemical evolution and cosmic recycling. I think it reminds us when we're at our smallest and most tribal that we're all connected. We're all progeny of this earth. We were born together in the same observable universe. That was Anjali Tripathi, Clara Souza Silva, Dennis White, Hakim Olushayi, Rana Ezzedine, and Jana Levin. For me, thinking about the vastness of our universe continues to feel both humbling and inspiring. Someday, when my daughter asks me how the universe came to be and why we exist, <laughs> I won't have all the answers. But at least I'll have a few. And until that day, I'll keep encouraging her to explore nothing less than the entire universe, while making sure she always feels grateful for this small, quick moment she has that we all have on our tiny blue planet. Nova Now Universe Reveal is a production of GBH and PRX. It's produced by Terrence Bernardo, Jenny Cataldo, Ari Daniel, Caitlin Folds, and Jocelyn Gonzalez. Julia Court and Krishman are the co-executive producers of Nova. Suki Bennett is senior digital editor. Christina Manan is associate researcher. Robin Kasmer is science editor. Robert Boyd is digital associate producer. And Devin Maverick Robbins is managing producer of podcasts at GBH. I'm Alok Patel. Thanks for joining me on this cosmic, baffling, fascinating adventure. If you love stories about our universe, visit pbs.org slash Nova Now Podcast and check out Nova Universe Revealed, a five-part film series about the same topics we've been discussing right here. Streaming now on the PBS video app, visit pbs.org slash Nova. This podcast has been made possible by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. That's all for now, Earthlings. Catch y'all soon in the multiverse. GBH.